there's been research ha has been done and the world health organization as well uh verify this and by saying that a, a person who has died by suicide have told somebody in the year before they died um now they're not maybe they're not going to come up to somebody and say i'm going to kill myself but i would ask i would ask the viewers of your youtube channel just to, just to think about this question if i was to stand up and say my life's not worth living what would people's reaction be to that most people would probably say i catch yourself on don't be talking like that ways up that's stupid talk now so it's just brushed off my training's about trying to investigate that hold on a second uh, what do you mean your life's not worth living or if you're if they're in company you would never asked anybody in a, in a group of friends but on their own you might you might see them later and you might say earlier on there you said your your life wasn't worth living uh, what did you mean by that is, is everything okay look uh, do you want to talk about that so you're giving you're giving people an opportunity just to talk but um the strange thing when philip died i was the first to say i came completely out of the blue uh, I, I didn't see anything um, that wasn't like him. In fact, at the time when we were looking for Philip, uh, I was convinced he would turn up the next day. I was I'd never believed for one minute that he would have ended his life. But as I said, it took me four years before I would talk to somebody. And it was only after that that I started to look then at photographs and I started to to look at Philip's life and think about it. And, and the signs were all over the place, but I couldn't see them. I mean, what kind of signs were there for you? Well, uh, I, Philip's mom and me got married when we were really young and we separated. And so uh, Philip then, uh, Philip's mom then got married and then I got married away later on again after that. So Philip was trying to deal with the fact that uh, his parents had broke up probably, right? But he was also, um, Philip, I believe, was suffer, suffered from dyslexia, but he wasn't, he wasn't stupid. He was very, very intelligent. Um, he, he was witty. Uh, he was a good-looking young lad. But there was also lots of pressures, and especially in the community in which we came from, you know, pressures of fitting in, pressures of um, his mum starting a new family, and, and later on us having a family as well. Um, and also pressures of relationships in terms of girlfriend and, and just the pressures that came with, with, all, with all that and trying to find a job, um, trying to work out where he was. And these, these may seem just uh, normal things, but for young people, they're, they're very much pressures. Um, and Philip then started to use, like, started to smoke cannabis, um, which then had an impact on, and how he would think of things and see things and um, and then I, I think he went on taking different drugs and stuff which then brought into conflict then with myself um, and his family and we would have arguments all the time because he was taking uh, drugs and that so all those things uh, impacted on his life on, on him and on his life the brain develops up until you're 26 and that by smoking uh, illegal substances uh, like like cannabis or taking other drugs, it has a, a detrimental effect on your brain and how it develops and, and the brain cells are being destroyed. You become paranoid. You you have lack of motivation and want to do anything. And you also have loss of memory. And all these things impact, uh, impact on our young people and young people don't realize that. I think life then becomes unbearable sometimes, but also, I believe that Philip's death is as many deaths out there of young people who have died by suicide have been an accident because I don't believe they wanted to die just in terms of the way they have done it. And sometimes I, I do believe that they think, I'm not really going to die, I'm going to come out of this. Yes. And sadly, uh, suicide is, can take hold very, very quickly. And it's like turning a light switch off or on. You cannot get out of it. Once you put something around your neck or something, like, you can be gone within a split second. And, you know, uh, Linda, I really have to say this, but there is no coming back. You're, 
You're gone, your laughter, your smell, to hear your voice never again. There is no dancing with the angels in the sky. There is no party in the sky. You're gone. And your family and your friends will never see your smiling face or hear your voice again or see you grow up to have a great future and grandchildren. And that's the sad thing. And, and people need, we really need to call it out for what it is. Okay. There is no coming back. And there's been research done, for instance, of individuals who have jumped off bridges or whatever. And there's not a whole lot have survived, but any that have survived, when they've been asked the question, what were you thinking when you stepped off? They've all said the first thought they had was, I don't want to die. No way. But it's too late. 